decision will do the work. We've got a packed three days for you, some really interesting presentations on a wide range of topics during one study and another panel study. We've got a number of workshops with different ideas and tools for how you might use the data effectively, social events tonight and tomorrow, and we've even ordered some sunshine, so we hope <coughs> that you will enjoy all of these things. If, however, there's anything you think we could be doing differently, Jay and Victoria have a post box on the section desk, and you can kind of put ideas into them about things you would like to see at conferences in the future. There's a leaflet in your pack with housekeeping information, so I'm not going to go through it except to be clear that there are no high world plans, so if there is an alarm goes off, that means that there's a genuine fire, so you should kind of leave the building uh, by the nearest exit. Um, for those of you who don't have own. There are Wi-Fi details on the table downstairs, and we have a Twitter hashtag of USociety19, so please do kind of tweet and follow that to kind of see what your colleagues are doing and feeling about the conference. Any uh, queries, then please ask Jay and Eleanor and Victoria, who are on the reception desk. Well, I have to be here at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so they're the people to ask if you have any queries about anything. Um, so I just want to give you a few pointers before we start to some of the things that we're doing during the conference to try and help you and support you with your use of the study. All of them are on this leaflet here that's in your pack. So on Wednesday and Thursday there are drop-in sessions and each session has some different people at it who are experts on different topics. So if you want to go and get some advice about weighting or genetics or or any other of the topics listed, then those uh, kind of members of the team will be there to help you uh, with using those kinds of data. On Wednesday lunchtime, our data and user support team, so uh, our Associate Director for User Support is there, well, <coughs> Aditi Nandi, and Data Beth, our uh, Data Director is there, John Payne. So they're going to be leading the session <coughs> on Wednesday lunchtime. You can go along and tell them things you'd like done differently to help you use the data. Things that would make it easier or uh, kind of materials we could produce or whatever. Um, so do go along and kind of tell us how we can help you uh, better. If you can't make the lunchtime session, there's a little card in your pack so you can kind of write your ideas on that. And there's another post box. Uh, what's that post box? On the stranger. So another post box. Yeah. Jay likes this post box <laughs> uh, on the registration desk uh, where you can put uh, those ideas. On Thursday lunchtime, our colleagues from ESRC will be here presenting their strategic plans for the future of data infrastructure uh, here in the uh, UK. So again, do go along and kind of hear what they've got to say and give them your ideas because they're very much at the sort of formative stage of their thinking and they would like to hear from data users and, and uh, people in policy who use data who, uh, about what you think of their plans. Um, just to mention the social events, so tonight there's going to be a reception at 6 o'clock hosted by UNSA, the Institute for Social and Economic Research, where Understanding Society is based. It's its 30th anniversary this year, so they're hosting the reception. It will be in the plaza outside the student building. And I have this plan to kind of point in the right direction, but I have no sense of direction. So, that way. So, that way. <coughs> Follow Jan. Um, and then tomorrow, we have a dinner at the local football stadium, and there will be coaches to kick us up. Again, ask Jay where to find the coach. Um, so now to the award part of um, today's welcome. At the last conference, we introduced prizes for the best uh, paper and the best paper by an early career researcher. And we've done the same again this year, so we uh, advertised for people to nominate papers, and then when the papers came in, we had a panel who read them all and uh, selected what they felt were the best papers. Um, so for the first prize for the best Understanding Society paper goes to Neil Lee, Katie Morris and 
common technique. Is that right? Uh, chaos is there. Um, but their paper on the immobility of the Brexit vote was published in the Journal of Regions, Economy and Society. And the judging panel said that, this is why they awarded the paper to you, as a prize to you, in the time of uncertainty regarding the next steps with Brexit, this paper explains some of the origins of the Brexit vote, linked to geographic mobility or immobility, regional levels of development, such as the level of wages, ethnic composition, as well as psychological traits. It's very well written in a comprehensive way, and from an understanding society perspective, you also link uh, the data with admin data, which is something we're trying to encourage, so we're, we're very pleased that you did that. So, um, we're very pleased to award you this prize. I have some certificates for you, if you'd like to come down, all of you. Especially through stress at work and its psychophysiological. 
physiological effects on health. He also has a strong interest in methodological issues in underpinning such research, and he's a member of NCRM, and on kind of teaching students how to get grips with these kinds of data. And he's working on the uh, ESRC Stocks B postdoctoral training uh, initiative. So it's been a pleasure to work with Rani and colleagues over the last few years on research using our biomarker data to really <coughs> understand how these data can help us kind of understand social uh, phenomena. And it's this work that Twani is now going to uh, present. Um, so over to you, Twani. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you very much for the invitation and, and for you to come to listen to me today. Um, so, um, Mikhaila gave you a broad introduction to, to the topic I'll, I'll be talking about, but basically it's going to be divided into three parts. I'll talk a little bit about the background to the research. Um, I'll be talking a lot about the use of biosocial research in, in, in trying to understand work and well-being. Uh, and perhaps some of the uh, criticisms and recommendations for better biosocial research in this particular topic. Um, as Mikhail said, I'm a medical, medical sociologist, and for a very long time I worked um, on the Whitehall II civil servant study on stress and health. So this was also a longitudinal data study um, collecting uh, social as well as biological data on civil servants as, as they aged. Um, and a lot of the work was on trying to understand why there are social inequalities in health. So here's some uh, data coming out from the first Whitehall study that was conducted in the 1960s, also on civil servants. And when this study came, came out, um, it, it, it puzzled a lot of people because it was a study of civil servants. So we're not talking about poor people here. We're talking about people who are in good jobs, but even Amongst those people in good jobs, uh, they saw a very strong gradient in the risk of in mortality rates. So the, the other groups are those in sort of clerical and, and support type organization, support type work, whereas those in the administrative groups are, are, are actually at the top of the civil servants, they're the top civil servants. And you can see that there's a strong gradient in the mortality rates uh, as, you, as you decrease in, um, in, in, in rank in the civil service uh, at 40 to 64 after retirement age and well into well past retirement age. So the second Whitehall study was set up to investigate what are the reasons behind, behind these uh, differential rates of mortality by employment grade. So it looked at the usual suspects like smoking, and of course smoking uh, is, is much more prevalent in the lower employment grades. Uh, I looked at other kinds of health behaviors as well, but it said that that can only account for a certain percentage of this mortality risk gradient. And the second Whitehall's two study was quite interested in other kinds of explanations like stress. You know, do, uh, do lower grade employ employees, are they more stressed at work? And to answer that, they collected uh, you know, measures of, of stress, biological stress reactions, like cortisol over the day. Um, and you know, uh, cortisol, some of you will know, that it has a sort of diurnal profile. So when you get up, you have a, a spike in your cortisol, and that should come down gradually until it's, it's almost negligible by the time you go to sleep. Uh, and what we found uh, in, in the study was that there was a profound difference between uh, civil servants in the top versus the bottom civil service grades. So those in the low grades in the brown, denoted by the brown lines here, are, have a much shallower decline in cortisol over the day, so that by bedtime, their levels of cortisol were still were markedly higher than those in the high grades. So this challenged a lot of research that says, well, actually, if you ask people uh, how stressed they are, it's always those in the top jobs that say, oh, I'm really stressed. Uh, so but when you actually measure their stress reactions, it's not those at the top, but those at the bottom of the civil service hierarchy that are, uh, that are more stressed in terms of their, bi their biological stress responses. So why am I talking about biosocial research? Um, as Mikhaila uh, already explained, I'm, I'm a part of the 
social to biological center for doctoral training center that's partly based here at Essex, at Manchester and at UCL, um, and also part of the National Center of Research Methods. And there we have a, a work package on missing biological data in, in, in surveys. So I'll talk a little bit about that in, in this presentation. And I'm also a member of the ESRC Center on Life Course Studies in Society and Health. So what is biosocial research? And um, this is quite a vague term. It's an umbrella term. So uh, back in the 60s and 70s, it was understood to be related to biological anthropology, not social, but biological anthropology. Uh, human sciences is another topic that is often taught in some of the, the universities. But with the advent of, of new biomarkers that are easily ex uh, available in, in data sets like genomics, like uh, n uh, n neurological measures, we find a whole host of, of new disciplines coming up like sociogenomics, neurosociology, neuroeconomics, and cognitive neuroscience. So these are quite different types of, of biosocial research. If we turn to the ESRC definition of biosocial research, we say that it's about uh, the interplays between biology, experiences, and behaviors over the life course. And quite Im importantly, it says that it's a multidisciplinary science that brings together expertise from biological, medical, and social sciences. So that enables an understanding of the complex pathways and mechanisms that shape our physical and mental health. So I just want to turn to this multidisciplinary science word because I always get confused. You know, what is the, you know, what's interdisciplinary? What's multidisciplinary? What's transdisciplinary? And I, I find this, this figure quite useful in understanding that this process as you go from within a single discipline on the far left to a multidisciplinary process where you have different disciplines that are maybe looking at the same research problem but not necessarily talking to each other very much towards a cross-disciplinary approach where, where these different disciplines are maybe talking to each other more so. Uh, and finally, towards, you know, you get interdisciplinary perspectives being um, developed so that you get a new discipline, a transdiscipline emerging. So according to the ESRC, we're very far away from the transdisciplinary stage. We're still at the multidisciplinary stage where you have these different disciplines in the social sciences, in the biological sciences, often approaching the same research problem but not necessarily talking to each other very much, uh, not necessarily engaging in much cross-disciplinary views. So this, most of my talk today is, is around what are the sociological criticisms of uh, biosocial research. And uh, for those of you who are sociologists, you know that we like to be critical. And, <laughs> and, and th there's actually been quite a lot of literature that's come out. Uh, as an explicit criticism of a lot of biosocial research, a lot of them coming from soci sociologists, some from social theorists, uh, some from criminologists and uh, anthropologists as well. Um, and uh, there are three main criticisms to a lot of biosocial research. The, the one being that it's the main one, it's deterministic. So it's, it's you know, it, it, it draws on this causal paradigm that's not necessarily true. But then there are other ones that it, it's, it's reductionist and it's normative. So I'll go through each of these criticisms one by one. Whenever you mention biosocial research, it's impossible not to mention eugenics. So genetic determinants, so everything that we do, that we are, our intelligence, our educational attainment is determined not by social factors, but our inherent biology that we inherit that are the genetics of, of that constitute us. So that's, that's one of the big worries that a lot of sociologists have about existing biosocial research. And it, 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 a lot of it is about the, the huge debates between nature versus nurture in intelligence um, and, and the worries about how racist uh, concepts like the bell curve are. Um, so I won't go into the, into the, the debates around the bell curve, but I, I will go into uh, what how this gets interpreted by influential people. Uh, so Toby Young, a lot of you will know, that is, um, was a, uh, um, he was a, an advisor or a minister in, for schools. He, I think he was for students, for the, for the Office for Students, before he was sacked after publishing this. So it was quite hard to find the original art, article that, that led to his sacking. But I think like uh, two days after this came out, he was sacked. And, um, and that's because he was, he was saying that um, more than half the variance in, in intelligence and IQ is due to genetic differences. 
and the, that the impact of the environment on children's attainment is negligible and that um, schools can't do much to ameliorate the effects of inequality. So here's a schools minister saying, well, schools are basically useless. It's all down to genetics. Um, so that led to his sacking. Um, but the, uh, the actual evidence basis that this comes from, that uh, heritability of IQ is so strong that social and environmental processes have very little say in them, uh, actually comes from really respected research. So we're talking about the top journals in the world, Nature. Nature Reviews, uh, a lot of them co-authored or authored by Robert Plowman. Um, so, so, you know, they come up with, with, with a lot of um, results looking largely at twin studies uh, to say, to estimate the heritability of, of things like intelligence and education. And they say, you know, this accounts for more than 20 or 20, yeah, so they're saying heritability of intelligence is really large. Um, and that we, you know, and these genetic risk factors or genetic factors that determine your education or intelligence are causal predictors in the sense that there's nothing in our environment, in our brains that can modify these DNA sequences that we inherit from our parents. So a deterministic view of intelligence or education is that we are genes, cause, our, cause us to be intelligent, which then causes us to have educational attainment. Uh, but of course, as a sociologist, we all think, uh, well, what about uh, the contribution of parents, the parent, the home environment, the parent's social class? And the answer to that is, well, you know, the parents have their genes as well. And because of homogamy, uh, actually, you know, parental education, the association of parental education with children's intelligence is confounded by the genetic effects of the parents' genes. So, that deterministic model is looking more like this, so genes of the parents determine their, their, their social class, uh, which also determines what kinds of genes the children inherits, which determines how intelligent or successful the children are in education. But a sociologist would say it's much more complex like than this. Why focus on just the genetic parts when there's a whole bunch of other determinants that we're not measuring in those kinds of models? You know, there are a whole bunch of environmental confounders and infect modifiers coming out from social processes that, that we need to examine as well. So a sociologist looks at this model and says that's too deterministic. Uh, we do, you know, even with the twin studies, we don't have such good evidence that this applies to the general populations. Uh, let's look at other factors. Uh, so that could be related to uh, educational attainment and intelligence. So that was one of the key criticisms about determinism that sociologists hate about biosocial research. The second is reductionist. Uh, so very often in a lot of biosocial research studies, the social is reduced to just one or two variables, like education. And even education, if you, if you, if you, if you see how education is actually measured, it's often the complexities of education is just reduced to this person has no education versus this person has some education. That's a, a binary variable. So you get uh, a rather mangy looking beast, an animal quite alien to the rich and fat understanding of century old anthropology or sociology. So the criticism is that, that biosocial has very little social in it. Um, and here's an example of, a, of uh, you know, it's a, a GWAS, a genetic genome wide association study of, um, of the genetic variants that are associated with educational attainment. Uh, so that you can see here just a huge number of studies went into this, into this GWAS study. Uh, I've just listed the very top few, but there, there, are, there are many, many more studies listed here. And this study has also been updated in, in very recently. So in, in GWAS terms, 2016 is quite an old study. But if you, if you delve into the actual studies um, and you look at their, their phenotype of interest, educational attainment, uh, again, it's, it's, it's measured in very different ways across these different studies. It's, you know, as a sociologist or as a social scientist, you might look at this and say, well, actually, you know, what does educational attainment mean for a cohort that's born in 1894 versus a cohort that's born in 1980? Yeah? How can that mean the same thing? 
but in the GWAS analysis, they treat it exactly the, like the same thing. It's still, you know, you have some education versus no education. And so that's this reduction of our, the complexity of our social lives to just a binary set of variables that, that a lot of sociologists um, are very critical about in biosocial research. And the third criticism is about normative. Um, so this is, uh, is, is about how we can, how a lot of biosocial research scales up inference from studies to populations, but there's often very little connection between the two. So one example here is there was a very strong epigenetics uh, literature on, uh, on rats. You know, so the mothers of rats, when, when, the, when, the, when, when their, um, when, when their um, pups are born, uh, so the, the very attentive mothers lick their, the, lick their pups regularly. So it's, it, and, and that means that the rats grow up to be very calm, calm rats. They're not stressed at all. Whereas the mothers that are uh, inattentive, uh, that don't nurture their, their, their pups when they're very, very young, off, just after birth, they don't lick them enough, uh, those rats grow up to be much more stressed. And so there are, there are detailed epigenetic processes that occur uh, right after birth. So these are uh, modifications in the way how genes are expressed that result in uh, the, the, the rat pups being stressed as adults or not. So when this study came out, uh, woo, there was a lot of policy interest in there. They said, wow, we now know why some kids do worse than others. Some human kids do worse than others. It's because of the mothers. They don't pay enough attention to their kids in very early life. So there's a whole set of policy programs that target pregnant women and mothers. Uh, you know, it's got nothing to do with social structures. It's got nothing to do with the poverty that, that young mothers live in. It's all to do with how inattentive those mothers are. So that's, an, that's another key criticism that, that a lot of sociologists have about biosocial research. Is that how can you extrapolate from a study about rat mothers to human, human populations? You know, so it's, 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 you're making normative assumptions about, about these, uh, these studies. Now, I've talked a lot about the soci sociological criticisms, but of course, there are criticisms about those criticisms as well. As well. So uh, not all of biosocial research is about eugenics, so I'll be talking about a few examples from my research. And also, it has a very static view of uh, biology, and we now know that biology is much, much more complex uh, th uh, than, than just genetics, and it's, it's a lot of sociological criticisms tend to be unaware of recent advances in, in, in biological sciences. Um, and the third bit, I think, is also quite crucial. It's very often sociology is very good at being critical, but not necessarily good at putting up recommendations. So I'll try and end with a few recommendations on what, how we could do better biosocial research. So, um, so for me, it's about the first thing is about let's have a bit more social and biosocial research. Um, so instead of looking at just how does the, our biology, our genes affect our social uh, attainment, let's look at it the other way around. You know, how does our social environment affect our biology? And so I'll talk ab about this with two examples from my research around work and well-being. The work and well-being agenda has been in the news. Uh, so about two years ago, Matthew Taylor uh, delivered the review of modern working practices. And originally, the remit of that was supposed to be around the, the gig economy. You know, what's happening to, uh, to, to employment practices? Is, is this going to be a successful way out for our economy? But, the, but actually, the report went much broader than that. So it looked into what constitutes good and bad work. Um, and, um, and it was very clear that bad work is bad for you. It's, okay, it's not um, you know, too enlightening, but you know, it said that bad work, insecure, exploitative, exploitative controlling is bad for health and well-being. But uh, they, Matthew Taylor also said, actually, yeah, that's bad, but at least it's not as bad as being unemployed. So the worst work status for health is unemployment. Uh, so I wanted to see, oh, is this true? Okay. So I, want, so I compared the biomarkers and health of the unemployed adults from wave one of understanding society and by waves two and three as they transitioned, in, some of them transitioned into work, into good working conditions, into bad working conditions, and I wanted to see how, how, how they were doing in terms of the health and biomarkers, comparing them to their peers who remained unemployed. 
The economists have been saying this for a very long time, that you know, be grateful you have a job, because almost any job is better than no jobs. Lord Laird has, has, uh, you know, has, has, has been saying that for, for a very long time. And that's partly based on a, a lot of panel studies, like Understanding Societies. This comes from the German Socioeconomic Panel. And it basically, it says that low-wage jobs are a springboard to success later on in life, to higher paid jobs. Um, now, this is, comes from the 1980s and some of the 1990s. It's actually been updated. I saw something in the news uh, yesterday about using Understanding Society that, that looks at something exa exactly like this, that concludes it is true that low-wage jobs are, are, you know, are, are important way, social mobility mechanism by which you get higher paid jobs. And it's much worse to be unemployed. It's very hard to transition from unemployment directly into high, high, paid, high paid work. However, the key thing here is that the 1980s is very different to the current labor market situation. And it's that springiness of that springboard that is that question. So there's definitely evidence from, uh, from other research that comes out that says actually it's not such a great springboard anymore. Low wage jobs, yes, of course it's an important way of transitioning to high wage work, but then you don't get the same bounce as you did uh, back in the 1980s. In terms of work and well-being, uh, this review by uh, Waddell and Burton, it's, it's quite old now, but it's still the key evidence basis for a lot of the work and health literature. And it says that re-employment is very important for health and well-being, for both physical and mental health. Uh, but then they do say that it depends on the quality of the job, yeah, quality and security of re-employment. So I wanted to see whether return to work into poor quality work uh, was associated with an improvement in health and well-being compared to the, the peers, their peers who remained unemployed. Um, so, you know, basically, are bad jobs good or bad for poor people in terms of their health and well-being? Uh, luckily, Understanding Society has, uh, has, uh, has wonderful data on job quality, and there are very many dimensions of job quality that can be measured. Uh, characteristics of the job itself, how skilled the job is, how intense the job is, and uh, the, the levels of control and autonomy of the job. Um, you know, the actual rewards from the job in terms of pay and, and also the intrinsic job rewards and how secure the job is. Uh, not all the dimensions are measured in understanding society, so I had to uh, look at low pay, uh, labor market security, and also how good quality uh, the, the work environment was in terms of job control, satisfaction, dissatisfaction, and anxiety. So the, the control group is the, the group of people that remained unemployed after about one or two years. And I contrasted them with those who were re-employed into good work, into you know, not so good work, but at least one of these bad job characteristics, onto really good bad work. You know, they were re-employed in work with at least two or more of these bad job characteristics. And I looked at their biomarkers in terms of the theory of allostatic load. So I'll talk a little bit about allostatic load here. And this is this idea that um, it's a dysregulation in our biological responses to, ad to adversity uh, that is cumulative. Uh, so the idea, uh, like, like cortisol in the first, very first slide I, I, I showed, is like it's normal to have a stress response. As you are attacked, you need to have the extra burst of energy to fight or, or flee. But the idea is that after the stressor has passed, your, your biological stress response comes down to, to negligible levels because it's, it's really harmful to have those hormones circulating in, in your body for a long time. So, um, and over time, you should adapt to those stressors, yeah? So once you've encountered the stressor before and it's actually not harmed you, you should think, okay, I've, I've, I've gone through this before and the, in, in the sort of the middle red line in the middle panel, it's, it's a process of normal adaptation. But in the bottom left panel, you have a group of people that don't adapt. They, they are repeatedly stressed and they have high levels of these circulating uh, hormones and other uh, biological um, proteins uh, that, that remain in the system for, high, for, for a long time. And also you have this, this group uh, that could have an inadequate response. So they're, they're, they, they experience stress, but they don't have a, a stress response. And in fact, their, their levels of stress remain quite, uh, you know, quite elevated, but, 
but they, they just have no stress reactivity. That's quite common in some groups of people like post-traumatic stress disorder people. Um, so the idea is that we use a range of, 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 of biomarkers in, um, in understanding society. Some of them are neuroendocrine related, you know, related to hormones. Some of them are related to our immune and inflammation function. Some of them related to sort of metabolic processes and cardiovascular processes and create an index of, of allostatic load. So uh, it's basically um, you know, those who are in the risk, high risk quartile of each of these, 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 these biomarkers. Uh, so the idea is that uh, you know, there are about 11 of these biomarkers that are measured. And so uh, it's a count from zero to 11. So uh, a one unit corresponds to uh, uh, a risk factor for each one of these biomarkers. So the higher these, these levels are, the higher your levels of allostatic load. So it's like a cumulative physiological dysregulation index that is related to your stress response. So this is what I was expecting. The unemployed people who are re-employed into good work I expected them to be, have the, the best outcomes. Yeah, they have fewer work stressors, they recover from stress, and they have low allostatic load and high well-being. And the bottom lines are those uh, who are unemployed, who remained unemployed, and I expected them to have the worst outcomes. They, are, uh, they have poor recovery from stress, and they have high allostatic load and low bell well-being. And the ones in the middle that are re-employed in poor work, uh, I expected them to be in the middle. Yeah, they have some work stress, uh, so there's partial recovery from stress, and so they, they would have middle levels of allostatic load and well-being. Um, the whole bunch, because it's understanding society, there's, there's a whole bunch of covariates that are measured, yeah, including health measures uh, and, and, and a whole bunch of, of control, control variables. Um, and this is what I found for, for self-reported self health. It was exactly as theorized, exactly as the literature uh, uh, said, said it would work. So those who remained unemployed had the lowest scores on, on physical, uh, sorry, on mental health functioning from the SF12. So a low score ind indicates worse functioning, a high score indicates better health. And those who were in, re-employed in good work, they had, they had a, an, an improvement in their, in their uh, mental health scores from baseline. This is comparing wave one to wave two um, uh, SF12 scores. And those who were re-employed in, in sort of poor quality work, either with one or two adverse job quality measures, that they were sort of they had middle levels of, of uh, mental health well-being. So it's exactly as I, I imagined. Um, but for allostatic load, it was a different picture. Uh, you can see here those who were re-employed into really bad work had the highest levels of, of allostatic load, much higher than their peers who remained unemployed. So this was the surprising f finding. And uh, of course, I looked at, looked at it in, in a number of ways. Uh, so those who remained unemployed were, we know that education is, is a strong selection process. So those who with higher educational qualifications, even when they were unemployed, were more likely to get a good job. Uh, and we, we also know that good physical health is a powerful predictor of getting a job. Whether it's a good or bad job, just getting any job, those, uh, those who had good health at baseline were much healthier than those who remained unemployed. If we, if we looked at this by the different allostatic load uh, it markers, we find that we found exactly the same thing if we looked at it in terms of HbA1c, triglycerides, cholesterol, inflammation, um, and, and, and kidney clearance rate. And I disentangled this by, by the different aspects of job quality, and it's exactly the same result came out, whether, it's looked at, whether I looked at low pay, job anxiety, low job control, and household dissatisfaction. Um, and the key thing is that income levels improve, household income levels improve for all adults who are re-employed compared to those who remained unemployed. So that's the puzzle here. Those who are re-employed into bad work had had, had higher household income. That's good. I mean, that, you think you work pays, yeah? But despite that, they had worse allostatic load biomarkers. So the, the, the summary of that piece of work uh, basically is that we observe selection of, of healthier people into good or bad work. You know, so the selection, the health selection argument really doesn't work here. Uh, and that 
job quality cannot be disregarded from the employment success of, of the unemployed. So regardless of whether bad jobs are a springboard to a better life, bad jobs are actually could be bad for health. So that, was, that, was, that came out uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, and I'll talk about a piece of research that came out uh, at the start of this year. Uh, it's about flexible work arrangements and, and whether that can be, that can be used to, to solve some of the pressures at work. We all know that work can be stressful. Hopefully, we don't have bosses like Dilbert's over here. Um, but what, what I wanted to find out is whether flexibility helps you to, to reduce workplace stress. Um, there is quite a lot of literature on self-reported measures of stress. So we know that, um, uh, that flexibilization of, of working times and workplaces is actually increasing because employees are now able to request flexible working arrangements. So what do I, what I mean by these flexible working arrangements? So, so you can, instead of working regular or standardized working hours at a single location, uh, you can vary those kinds of working arrangements in terms of temporal or spatial uh, arrangements. Um, and these flexibility is meant to provide more control for the employee. So in, and we know that job control is good for health, so it's supposed to reduce their, their levels of stress. But there's some skepticism. Uh, so a lot of worry is about uh, part-time work. The most common form of flexible working arrangements is part-time, and there's a, there's a lot of worry that that leads to ghettoization of, of women's work, part-time work. Uh, and also there's this worry about reducing the, the boundaries between work and family life can, can lead to st new stressors. Yeah? So if you take home a lot of work, then that's not good for your well-being. This has flexibility uh, in the workplace has gained a lot of attention, partly because the trade union congress has called for a four-day working week, and there are uh, sort of uh, experiments that are coming out from companies such as in New Zealand that show that there are productivity benefits to a four-day working week, um, as well as well-being benefits. But looking at the 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 data from Understanding Society, um, flexibility is measured in terms of reduced hours working, which is either part-time working, the most common form, or you worked term time or job sharing. Variable hours, where, you, where you, 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 you work to a set of hours, but you vary the timing of the work, like flexi time or annualized hours. Or you can restructure those hours in terms of compressing those hours in your working week. And the other flexible working arrangements, which are you know, either working from home or using more informal flexible working arrangements. Yeah, so you, so you, there's, there's less control over those. Um, in terms of the, the, the biomarker data in, in understanding society, um, those of you who have used it will know that there's, there's quite a drop from the, the numbers that are eligible for the, for the nurse visit from understanding society to how, how much biomarker data there actually is. Some of it is due to um, consent processes. Some of it is due to health processes. Um, and in, in my data, because I'm looking at uh, flexible working arrangements, I'm only, interest, I'm only interested in current employees. So that's why it reduces down quite remarkably to 6,000 or so current employees with the relevant biomarker data. Um, and so, there, so I needed to, f a, a lot of the review process was about trying to to, to understand these, these processes that result in my current, in the sample that I analyzed to see whether if I compensated for missing data, how that changed the analysis. So what are the predictors of flexible working arrangements? We know that women are more likely to use flexible working arrangements and that there's some age and gender interactions. I'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, the most socially advantaged are more likely to be in jobs, in the kinds of jobs where they can use flexible working arrangements but they don't make use of them. Actually, it's the socially disadvantaged, those in the lowest incomes, and the semi-routine social classes that are more likely to actually use flexible working arrangements. Um, and the one exception is other flexible working arrangements. That's ones where you're working from home. So you can imagine if you're a semi-routine worker, your manager isn't gonna trust you to work from home. But if you're a professional worker, of course, your manager says, yeah, yeah, of course you can work one day from home. I trust you to do that work. So the levels of scrutiny are much less uh, if you're in, the, in, uh, if, if you're in a, a professional job. This is the age and gender distribution of, of reduced hours flexible working. The green bars are the ones to keep your eye on. These are the people that are making use of reduced hours flexible working. Yeah? So this is largely part-time working. 
it's no surprise that the women have much greater uh, use of reduced hours flexible working compared to the men, but there's a U shape for men. Uh, so, you know, amongst the, the younger men and the men after retirement age, there's a, there's, there's a higher prevalence of, of reduced hours flexible working. Um, and for the women, you see, as, as they get older, they're much more likely to make use of reduced hours flexible working. Who needs flexible working? It's, it's the women with childcare responsibilities. So if you have two or more children under the age of 16, you're much, much more likely to make use of reduced hours flexible working. And this is a social class distribution. So uh, for the women, it's very clear that it's those in the semi-routine occupations that are more likely to make use of reduced hours flexible working. And you can see that that's somewhat true also for the men, although to a lesser extent. And that's really important because when we're thinking about um, interventions to improve the health and well-being of people, most of these interventions actually tend to work for those who are advantaged already. Here is an intervention, part-time working, that seems to be more prevalent amongst the more, the more disadvantaged. Uh, it's the same pattern for, for income. Those are the, on the extreme right are those in the highest income quintiles, and the levels of reduced hours flexible working reduces as you increase in household income. So these are the sort of the correlations between uh, allostatic load and reduced hours flexible working. And the only sort of statistically, statistically significant result was for in the top left-hand corner. Yeah. So remember, I looked at reduced hours, flexi time, and other flexible working arrangements. And for the flexi time and other flexible working arrangements, there was no association between the different types of flexible working arrangements, whether you made use of them and our static load, but only for the reduced hours flexible working, where for both men and women, not just women, for both men and women, uh, those that made use of, 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 of reduced hours flexible working had lower allostatic load. Now I compared this, it's just, the left hand slide is the same as the top left hand slide as before, with self reports of health. And it's the exact opposite. So here on the, on the right hand side, it's this, the predicted self rated health. The higher score indicates worse health. So those men and women who made use of reduced hours flexible working actually report their health as the worst. And that's particularly true for the men. And it's no, you know, there's a selection effect going on here. So the men, kinds of men who make use of reduced hours flexible working probably need to do so because of health problems. That's well known. What's surprising is that they have lower levels of allostatic load. And this is the, the, one, this is the very nice thing about biomarkers. It's telling us something different from what the self-reported data are telling us. And that's, 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 that's something really remarkable that we can use from studies like Understanding Society. And if we break that down uh, in terms of uh, you know, childcare responsibilities, if you're looking after two or more kids, the fact that you can, uh, these are women, because actually um, there, there are very few men that are the main care for two or more children, even in Understanding Society, uh, that had all the biomarkers measured. So, uh, so this is analysis of women and women who have two or more kids that are making use of reduced hours flexible working. They had levels of allostatic load as similar to those women with no kids. Um, and the women who had all those childcare responsibilities but were working in jobs where, they, where reduced hours flexible working was not available, you know, the blue bars on the right hand side, they, they had the highest levels of allostatic load. So, uh, so those are two examples from, from my research on work and well-being that use biomarkers that I think you know, moves away a little bit from this biosocial approach towards maybe a more social biological approach. The second recommendation for uh, better biosocial research is that we've got to move away from heritability estimates. So a lot of the confusion that comes out in policy recommendations, like from Toby Young, that says, well, you know, uh, you know, 60% of educational attainment is due to um, um, uh, what you inherit from your parents. A lot of that is coming from twin studies, heritability estimates from twin studies. And actually, it's, you know, when you're looking at it in the general population, those heritability estimates come down, come down quite a bit. And so, so the recommendation is not actually looking, using heritability estimates because they're not very useful. Uh, but the, the tough bit is understanding what is it that those genes actually do? What are the biological processes that, that 
uh, are resulting from those genes and how do they interact with, with, with social and environmental factors. The, the third recommendation is, is not to be afraid of population heterogeneity. Uh, so a, a lot of the time, a lot of biosocial research is about trying to say, oh, you know, we analyze a very homogenous population, so we control for all kinds of things. But actually, what a lot of social science is interested in is generalizing to the wider population. So, so we need to understand what makes the sample unique and non-representative so that we can have a better understanding of selection of, of bio, biosocial samples. So uh, here's some example of a UK biobank. It's not a population representative sample. It's largely a sample uh, of, of middle-aged white men, basically. Yeah. Adults living uh, age 40 to 69 who are living in, uh, in urban centers or close to urban centers. And uh, the biobank study came up with this peculiar um, inference about their study, about how representative their study were, was in terms of uh, black and ethnic minority populations. So they said, in the UK Biobank cohort, about 95 of the participants were of white ethnicity, which is not too bad. And it's similar to the national population of the same age range uh, in 2001, uh, but somewhat higher than, uh, than in 2011. So they're saying, okay, it's sort of you know, in between, and UK Biobank was collected in between 2001 and 2011. I saw this and I was horrified. I was like, okay, it was published in American Journal of Epidemiology, Maybe those reviewers, they don't know anything about the, the makeup of our ethnic minority populations in these, these cities. But as social scientists, you will know that, that actually, you know, 70, yeah, at least you know, less than 70% of the urban population in those cities are of white ethnicity. So, the, so this claim that the UK Biobank is, is actually not too bad in terms of population representative of ethnic minorities that they made in an American Journal of Epidemiology, it doesn't, it doesn't hold for social scientists. It's just, that's not true. So we lose a lot of the rich social detail of who are and who are not included in biosocial studies by ignoring non-response population representation. I'll, I'll give some examples. This is an example from research that's not yet published just yet. Uh, it's coming again from the Whitehall to civil servant study. So okay, it's civil servants. It's not, I'm not making claims to, about how representative the, the, this civil servants are of the general population. But in terms of who has biomarker cortisol data actually collected, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of missingness. You know, about 20% of the sample in this wave don't have the, the, this cortisol data collected. So okay, it's not enormous. 20% is not enormous, but it's still not negligible. And um, I looked at, you know, I did some, with, with my PhD student, we did some multiple imputations trying to come up with good auxiliary variables that predict missingness. And we found that, okay, statistically, you, you know, the, the difference between these two plotted lines is, is, not, is not different. But substantively, they, they do make, they, they do make a, a, a case. Uh, so the imputed analysis from uh, estimates from multiple imputation are the, the blue solid line, the dotted line, uh, in red is the available case analysis. So th the left-hand panels are for those in the high job grades. The right-hand panels are those in the low job grades. So the diurnal profile of cortisol, you know, as it slopes down during the day, you see that there's a much steeper decline for the imputed analysis on the left-hand side and a, and, a, and a much shallower decline in cortisol over the day for, for those in the low-grade jobs. So this is saying that if we don't do some form of taking account of the missing data in our analysis, uh, we could possibly underestimate the socioeconomic differences, the job grade differences in the profile of diurnal cortisol profile. So, you know, as I said, this is only you know, about 20% missingness, but when we've got larger amounts of missingness, we're possibly underestimating the social factors that are influencing our, our, our stress responses. So my final recommendation is, it's, you know, as I, as I showed earlier on, a lot of this research gets published in the top science journals. Why isn't it published in, in, in more social science journals? So we've got to sort of influence uh, publication in social science journals. But of course, you know, I'm, I'm one of the editors on you know, a social science journal, and it's hard to find the reviewers that have um, the, the expertise and breadth to, to, to address some of the, the very complex detail of some of the, the um, 
the biosocial research. So uh, my last couple of slides, um, you know, it's, it's always a disciplinary bun fight, you know, who is at the top? And often us, us sociologists are, you know, right at the, the left-hand side, you know, we're looked down upon by the psychologists saying, sociologists just applied psychology, uh, the biologists poo-pooing the psychologists saying, psychology is just applied biology, and the chemists and physicists saying, you know, oh, we're on top. And the mathematicians say, you know, being the, the purest of all sciences saying, oh, you know, you're, 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 I can't see you, you're all the way over there. But sometimes it's good to think outside the box, you know, like the philosophers. So it's, it's good to have these kinds of interdisciplinary um, workings in, in our research. So uh, I'd like to end by thanking all uh, my funders and co-authors. Thank you.